Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. Most are afraid of unknown depths, skirting shores thinking world flat. I'm with the island girls in celebration of new religion. Nobody led me or said this way. I sailed alone on makeshift raft with wind as companion. Fate for deliverance, confidence enough to assess new disposition. Seekers of lost paradise may seem fools to those who never sought the other world. Welcome to Momentary Zen with Zen Garcia. Visit www.fallenangels.tv. You're listening to Revolution Radio. And he took up his parable and he said, Enoch, a righteous man whose eyes were opened by God, saw the vision of the Holy One in the heavens, which the angels showed me. And from them I heard everything and from them I understood as I saw, but not for this generation, but for a remote one, which is for to come. Concerning the elect, I said, and took up my parable concerning them, the Holy Great One will come forth from his dwelling, and the eternal God will tread upon the earth, even on Mount Sinai, and the appear from his camp and appear in the strength of his might from the heaven of heavens, and all shall be smitten with fear, and the watchers shall quake, and great fear and trembling shall seize them unto the ends of the earth. And the high mountains shall be shaken, and the high hills shall be made low, and shall melt like wax before the flame. And the earth shall be wholly rent in sunder, and all that is upon the earth shall perish, and there shall be a judgment upon all men. But with the righteous he will make peace, and will protect the elect, and mercy shall be upon them, and they shall all belong to God, and they shall be prospered, and they shall all be blessed. And he will help them, and light shall appear unto them, and he will make peace with them. And behold, he cometh with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to destroy all the ungodly and to convict all flesh of all the works of their ungodliness which they have ungodly committed and of all the hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him welcome friends i'm your host zen garcia this is momentary zen here on revolution radio at freedomslips.com and we come to you every wednesday evening 8 to 10 p.m eastern to on studio b to discuss all things esoteric uh this evening i'm going to be speaking about what is the oldest prophecy contained in the the canon of the holy scriptures and it's found in genesis 3 and verse 15 and for those that are familiar it has to do with the enmity of the seed lines but also of the coming of our king and lord as was spoken about in by Enoch in that previous parable about this being written, um, that parable and his description of the coming of the Holy One from the heaven of heavens, that all of that was written not for this generation, the one that he was living in, but for a remote one, which is for to come which in my opinion we are that generation we are that 
fig tree generation. I've spoken about that in great detail as far as the parable of the fig tree and how all of that was confirmed and fulfilled with the, um, the regathering of the nation of Israel in 1948. And I know that, again, uh, how a lot of people, uh, because it was an agenda that was put forth by the Rothschild elite and through the United Nations, and that Harry Truman, I believe Harry Truman, uh, that he was bribed with several million dollars in cash to vote for the creation of, of the nation state of Israel, but how all of that, was part of the New World Order agenda uh, from the giving forth of Albert Pike's vision in 1871 and how he even spoke then of the need to foment three global wars as pretext to bring forth and to divide in opposition, controlled opposition, the Christian nations the Western world from that of the radical, fundamental Muslim extremists and how they would pin the Zionists against these extremist Muslims and that they would use the creation of Israel to, as it says in Zechariah 10, uh, Jerusalem shall be a cup of trembling amongst the nations. And yes, it is something that most certainly was planned and that was orchestrated and pushed as ideology by the satanic elite. However, nothing, nothing can be completed. Nothing can be done. Nothing goes forth and occurs in history without the blessings of the Most High and also without it fulfilling His Word and the descriptions of the prophecies as laid out by so many prophets in the Old Testament, Malachi, Ezekiel, uh, Jeremiah, others, so many. Many of them spoke about the recreation of Israel and the blooming of the fig, fig tree as referenced by Yeshua. And so anyways, this evening we're going to talk a little bit about this specific prophecy, which, is, which was um, 4,000 years old at the time that it was uh, fulfilled as far as there was prophecy given to Adam uh, of the coming of Christ when he was banished and cast out of paradise even. And the prophecy in Genesis 3.15 where it says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shall bruise his heel that this specific prophecy not only is it alluding to the garden parable and what occurred and what Christ is also referencing in Matthew chapter 13 which we have covered in great detail and I'm not going to go into it at any great length here but Specifically, what occurred in the garden, and as I have discussed and as I have shown in great elaboration in my work, in which I am now currently, even today, working in project on what is the second book of the Great Contest, on the enmity between the seed lines, that this book is called the the great contest book two the enmity between the
the seed lines, the seed of the woman, and the seed of the serpent. Not including that last aspect, but... Um, and, and so basically, it, it talks about, all throughout Scripture, Christ references it, references it in the parable of the sower and also the parable of the kingdom um, of what occurred in the garden and how where it says and when it discusses all throughout scripture Eve being beguiled by the serpent and eating fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil how that is metaphoric and it is actually symbolic of her being wholly seduced as it says in the Hebrew and also in the Greek in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 2 and 3 uh, how it says and specifies that it was ease being wholly seduced that led to them being cast out of the heavens for really why else would God, what the Lord God, why would he exile Adam and Eve from paradise for eating an apple? I mean, really, how does that in any way make any kind of sense? It's absolutely ridiculous, in my opinion. And especially when you go to Genesis um, 3.15, and you look specifically at the curses that were levied against the serpent and also against the woman. And this is, again, the first part of the prophecy where, verse 14, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, beguiling Eve, seducing her, tempting her to eat fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Speaking to the serpent still, put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, a lot of people don't understand that the second half of this verse, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel, that this verse is alluding to the crucifixion of Christ upon the cross. And I'll explain this in a little bit. And I'll go into detail on this. But first, it'll lay out the premise of this whole, how the curses could anyway that are levied against the serpent, against Eve, against Adam, how they in any way could make any sense if they were banished and cast out of paradise for having eaten an apple, which is the, I mean, look at all the illustrations of what occurred in the garden. And most of them will show you the serpent speaking to Eve and tempting her to eat an apple. Even though it's nowhere in scripture that Eve ate an apple or a fig, or a pomegranate, or any other literal fruit. And again, it's because it's symbolic. It is veiled. And this is one of the deepest, most profound secrets of the gospel narrative. And it is only in understanding the premise of what I am bringing forth here in postulation, and which I, I have spoken about in great detail for many years now, and which I have also been heavily criticized and really condemned. I mean, because I can't tell you the number of people that will just simply not have 
any association with me because of my speaking about this in the manner that I do. And for whatever reason, they don't are just completely unwilling to examine it, to look into it, or to side with it in the manner that I am presenting it. But for whatever reason, this particular truth is blacklisted heavily amongst the revelations of truth that are out there and that are being brought to light in this day and age. Because it is, again, my opinion that indeed the Most High God is unveiling his secrets and revealing his truths and bringing forth his revelations in manner that is now going to be accessible to those that are truly seeking them. And um, God bless my my brother Jonathan Cleck. He know he knows what it's like to to speak about this and to get attacked at every angle and by everybody uh, for having done so. And so, um, but again, for whatever reason, this this key, this secret is so adamantly opposed. It's so crazy to me. It's, But again, um, even though I have affirmed its veracity and authenticated it from so many angles with many extra biblical and extra canonical texts and the Nakamati Codices and the Apocrypha and the Pseudepigrapha and all these different texts, it, it's unnecessary to have to study all that material in order to understand that this is deeply encoded into the scriptures. That it only takes understanding the words of Christ as laid out in Matthew chapter 13 in the fullness of that chapter to make sense of what I'm speaking about and in the manner that I'm speaking about it. Because if you go to verse 24 there in Matthew 13, I'm not going to cover this in great detail, but I do want to set the foundation for what I'm going to be speaking about this night. Uh, because I'm basically going to be presenting some information which is connected to the release of what will be this second book of the trilogy on the Great Contest. And I'm very close to being completed with it. Should be less than two weeks, I believe. In fact, I'm waiting on the book cover and then it should be it should be done. Now I'm doing the final proof read now. But anyways, the amount of information which I'm going to be bringing forth in this new book uh, on it's basically a, a deep elaboration on Lucifer father of Cain my fourth book and it's all the new information that I've discovered since the publication of that book in April of 2010 and it's a lot of information so much so that I had to, in rewriting the material and adding all this information, I had to split up that book into three different segments because it was well in excess of a thousand pages of information when it had originally been published as a 320 or 30 page book. And so lots, lots of new information. And so anyways, really quickly. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept. All right. This, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. And so that good man that sowed the good seed, that would be Adam. 
and the good seed which was brought forth was Abel. But notice verse 25, but while men slept, either, you know, not that he was physically asleep, but that he was unconscious to his tending to and taking care of his wife and keeping track of Eve. But while men slept, his enemy came, that's Lucifer, Satan the adversary, Samael the angel of death, and sowed tares among the wheat. The tare is Cain, the progenitor of the tares and the goats, and the wheat among the wheat, that was Abel. And so within Eve's bosom, you have both Cain and Abel as fraternal twins. Continuing. His enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and then went his way. Next verse, 26. But when the blade was sprung up, meaning when the children were born, and brought forth fruit, the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, meaning that her water broke, she conceived, and she bore these children, the fruit, brought forth fruit, meaning Abel and Cain. Then appeared the tares also. So when she conceived and had her children, then all of a sudden, the enemy which had sowed the tares and went his way, his fruit was found among the wheat, meaning Cain was born and then Abel was conceived and they were fraternal twins from different fathers. And so, verse 27, and so the servants of the householder, that is, the angels of the Most High God, came and they said unto him, Sir, didst thou not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? And so then uh, God basically said, Yeah, um, you know, we were supposed to have only good children in here. But they ask him, the angels ask him, Well, you know, among humankind whom you created, how did this bad seed, where did these tares come from? And in verse 28, he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? You know, so the angels are saying, Do you want us to go ahead and gather these, you know, these bad seed up, root them up, and get rid of them? But then God says to them, the Lord God says to him, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And so, this is where the root of continuance is laid forth for both the Kenites as the seed of Cain and also the giants as the children of the watchers. Let both grow together until the harvest. The harvest occurs with Yeshua's second coming. It is at that time that the wheat will be gathered for preservation and entrance into New Jerusalem and uh, a restoration of their first estate being allowed to enter into paradise. But the tares will be gathered for burning. And just to clarify, just to clarify in great detail, after the multitudes are sent away and Christ is speaking to his apostles without parable, speaking to them 
directly, they ask him, they say, Jesus, declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. In some versions it says, we know it not. And then he answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man, which is why when you go to the lineage of Christ in Luke chapter 3, and also there's a complete lineage chart, a genealogical list in the Cave of Treasures as well as the Book of the Bee, it skips Cain. And um, there was a recent comment on one of my videos that spoke about how Jude in... I believe it's verse 14, and when we return for break, I'll read this and elaborate a little bit further. But uh, how Jude mentions Enoch as being the seventh from Adam, and that when you count including Adam as the patriarch of the of you know the children of the the woman, the seed of the woman and of the wheat, that if you include Cain, Enoch is the eighth from Adam and not the seventh. And so that, again, is confirmation that Cain is not included into the genealogy of Christ or counted among the children of Adam, which is exactly what it says in the Targum in Genesis chapter 5, which is the chapter where the children of Adam are cited in lineage. And it is in Genesis chapter 4 that you have the children of Cain being cited, the first 10 generations being cited in, in lineage. And uh, when we come back from break, I'll elaborate further on these points because it's going to set the premise for the topic of this evening's show is crushing the head of the serpent and i'm going to i'm going to explain how christ ties into the latter part of genesis chapter 3 verse 15 which for those that don't know and haven't heard me speak about this is one of the just most deeply profound revelations and confirmation of Christ being the uh, immaculately conceived son of the most high God. And um, it's absolutely a fascinating story. And so we'll elaborate further when we come back from this. But also, just so you know, those of you that haven't listened to us uh, over you know the past couple of weeks or so, that I did finish and I released the first book of the Great Contest trilogy called The War in Heaven. All right, we'll be right back. All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, Simply at, uh, Tribal asks um, whether I'll be covering Golgotha and the skull and its connections to the Genesis 3.15 prophecy. And yes, that that is where we'll be uh, going into and concluding this whole particular uh, study this evening. But just to elaborate a little bit further in setting the foundation for what I will be talking about with regard to, to that, as far as Golgotha. Um, again, in Jude, in verse 14, first chapter 1, first, first Jude, um, verse 14, and Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. And so, first off, let's notice that Jude knows of Enoch. He knows of the very passage that I read from at the very beginning of the show where it talked about in the book of Enoch at the very bottom of that parable where it says, 
in verse 9, chapter 1, And behold, he cometh with ten thousand of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to destroy all the ungodly. And so Jude is basically paraphrasing and quoting almost verbatim directly from the book of Enoch. And so you know he's very well versed as to what the book of Enoch is speaking about and contains in material. And that he cites here in this verse that Enoch is the seventh from Adam, which as I said in the previous verse, if you include Cain in that count as a child of Adam, then it just does not add up. We can go to Luke chapter 3, verse 38 and 37 for verification of this. Because it's in that particular chapter that the lineage of Christ is asserted all the way from Adam being the son of God to, um, I believe it's Healy. Yes, right here. Uh, in verse 23, it says, And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. Now, we know that Joseph was not the real father of Christ, but still, if in the lineage, you can trace back both Joseph and Mary through to the children of Adam and through the line of David and Solomon and et cetera and so far and so forth. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, all, I mean, all the patriarchs are included in Yeshua's line. And so, anyways, returning back to verse 38 and 37, it says this in 37, which was the son of Methuselah, which was the son of Enoch, which was the son of Yared, which was the son of Malaliel, which was the son of Canaan, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Now, again, Cain is excluded from Adam's genealogy. And I, as I said previously, when you look up, um, when you look up in the Targums in Genesis chapter five, which is the the particular chapter where Adam's lineage is listed, then of course you discover that. In that chapter, it specifies specifically that Cain is not to be genealized, neither his seed among the children of Adam in the Targum. It doesn't say that in Genesis chapter 5 of the King James. But again, the reason I like to study the Targum, not only is it more ancient and predates the King James by uh, 2,000 years, in my opinion. There's a lot, and Wikipedia will actually um, ascribe it as being only dating back to the first century CE. But when you understand that the Targums came into being and were authorized in translation because of the, di the diaspora of 587 BC when the Israelites were taken into bondage and led into the captivity of Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar, and that for the 70 years that they spent there, that it was during that 70 years that they acclimated and assimilated Aramaic as the language, as their predominant colloquial language uh, for barter trade and uh, for surviving there in the Middle East, that when they returned um, 
with the release of Cyrus and Darius and the rebuilding of the temple, that after the temple was rebuilt and worship reinstituted, it was necessary for the high priest to stop often to translate the Hebrew Torah into Aramaic. And that this is where the Targums came about as need to basically translate the Hebrew into the Aramaic so that the people could study their scriptures and follow along. And so why would you wait 500 years to make that translation available if the people need it in 500 BC? You wouldn't. And so for Wikipedia and others to say that these translations date to the first century CE or, or thereafter is ludicrous because the, the translations would have came about immediately after need for them came forth, which again was after their return from the diaspora. So maybe what, 500 BC? You take the 70 years and then however long it took to rebuild the temple and then the reinstitute of worship. And that's when immediately they would have needed this Aramaic translation in order to um, basically have assembly. And so maybe 4 BC at the latest, somewhere around there. I mean, that's, you know, giving 180 years for that, that window of need. So anyways, um, yeah, these are the scriptures that the Hebrew people themselves were studying from and learning from and reading in order to understand their holy scriptures. And I'm not saying don't study the King James because, of course, I study the King James every day and read from not just it as the English translation, but all the other English translations. I read them all. But my favorite is the Targum, and it's because it is the most ancient and it is the Aramaic translations of the original Hebrew Torah. And I find that they have a lot more detail when it comes to specific chapter and verse than any of the other English translations. And to, just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, I'll read Genesis chapter 5 from the Targum, where it says this. This is the book of the genealogy of man in the day that the Lord created man. In the likeness of the Lord, he made him male and female he created them and blessed them in the name of his word. And he called their name man in the day they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and begat Sheth, who had the likeness of his image and of his similitude. Now this is the part that is excluded from the other translations. For before had Hava, Hava meaning life giver, born Cain, Cain meaning acquired or possession, who was not like to him. And Abel, meaning breath, was killed by his hand. And Cain was cast out, neither is his seed genealized in the book of the genealogy of Adam. But afterwards there was one born like him, and he called his name Sheth which means substitute, replacement. And the days of Adam after he begat Sheth were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. And so, I mean, you can't get clearer than that. Which, you know, the reason I embraced Serpent Seed as revelation was because of my study of the Targum. Because it makes it absolutely clear. And so again, and Cain, oh wait, 
And Hava born Cain, who was not like to him, and Habel was killed by his hand. And Cain was cast out, neither is his seed genealized in the book of the genealogy of Adam. I mean, how you can deny that? Uh, the fruit was an apple? I mean, come on. All right, so let's go back just really quick. Look at chapter 3 of Luke and count. You have Adam, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Malalil, Yared, and Enoch. That's seven. If you, just like the genealogical chart here in Luke chapter 3, which excludes Cain, from Adam's lineage, because again, he was not Adam's son. You have Enoch as the seventh from Adam, exactly as Jude references it in verse 14 of chapter 1 of Jude. And remember, Jude was the half brother of Christ. He was one of the apostles. He was one of the older brothers of from Joseph's previous marriage. As was Thomas, as was several of the other apostles. And so who would know better? And so Jude is absolutely a trustworthy witness. And so, yes, again... If you have, let's count it with Cain, Adam, Cain, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Malalil, Yared, and Enoch would be eighth from Adam. Again, if Cain is included in his line, but he is not. Now, there's one other thing I'd like to bring up. And I'm going to pull it up real quick. It is from the Book of Jubilees. And I believe it's in chapter 3, maybe. Let me see. It's after the creation where it lists the, the children. Oh, uh, here it is. Um, it's in chapter four, where it talks about the, you know, Cain killing Abel. But, um, and this is interesting too, because in this particular text, and also in the first book of Adam and Eve, it speaks about that Cain and Abel were born with twin sisters and that what happened, even though in Genesis, in chapter 4 uh, of the King James Version and even the Targum, it references, you know, Cain and Abel being born of, of twins. I'll read the Targum Version because it gives you a little bit more detail. The Genesis chapter 4 verse 1 in the Targum says, and Adam knew Hava, life bringer, his wife, who had desired the angel. That's the part that's left out of the King James. Who had desired the angel, semicolon. And it was her desiring the angel which led to the birth, and she conceived and bare Cain. And she said, I have acquired a man. And in some of the versions it says, I have acquired a man from the angel of the Lord. What angel is she speaking about? Samael, the angel of death, which if you go to the chapter 3 in the Targum, it references the serpent as Samael, which is the angel of death. It's one of the alternative names for Satan, the adversary. And so, again, it was her desiring the angel that led to her conceiving and bearing Cain. 
And she said, then, I have acquired a man from the angel of the Lord, which makes complete sense. If you understand that Cain was, in fact, the child of Samael, the angel of death. It makes complete sense. And then the next verse, and she added to bear from her husband. And so Adam's eating of the fruit too means that he repeated the act with Eve and that she added to bear from her husband, Adam, his twin, even Abel. And so in Genesis chapter four, verse one and two, you have Cain and Abel being born as fraternal twins. It's called heteropaternal superfecundation. And it means basically that she gave birth from two uh, fraternal twins from two separate fathers. But in the Jubilees version of this story, and also in the first book of Adam and Eve and others, it mentions um, twin sisters being born with both Cain and Abel. And so it makes you wonder if Eve gave birth to four instead of two. Now, I'm not saying that's the way it is, but I'm just, you know, saying it's a possibility because the some of the stories actually cite it in that manner. And so I'll just read quickly um, Cain, the the chapter about the, the, the sisters as well. Um, well, this one, in this one, it only mentions one she gave. All right, it says, in the third week, in the second jubilee, she gave birth to Cain. And in the fourth, she gave birth to Abel. And in the fifth, she gave birth to her daughter, Awan. In the first book of Adam and Eve, it mentions... Cain giving birth with a twin sister named Lulawa. Lulawa, which means the beautiful. And um, Abel is born with a twin sister named Akilah. I forget what the name Akilah means. But anyways, the specific reason why I wanted to mention this particular chapter is that in Verse 7 in the book of Jubilees in chapter 4, it says, And Adam and his wife mourned for Abel four weeks of years. And in the fourth year of the fifth week, they became joyful, and Adam knew his wife again. And she bare him a son, and he called his name Seth. For he said, God hath raised up a second seed unto us on the earth instead of Abel. For Cain slew him all right did you did you catch that and she bare him a son he called his name seth for he said god hath raised up a second seed unto us on the earth instead of abel now if cain were the child of adam and eve seth would be their third son not their second but again because Cain is not the child of Adam, but the son of the serpent, it makes sense here that, well, that God raised up a second seed. All right, we'll be right back. And that, that was Seth instead of, because Abel was murdered by his half-brother. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back, everybody, for a second hour. Uh, just a couple more things, and then I'll, elaborate on the um the fulfillment of the second portion of genesis 3:15 uh, but we're still speaking about the the first aspect of it just to you know clarify um that this is what is spoken about both by Christ and by John in chapter um 1 John chapter 3, verse 12, that when you look that up in Bible Hub, in as far as um, that particular verse, 1 John chapter 3, which is, for those that know 
their scriptures very well is the verse where it says Cain who was of that wicked one. But anyways, when you look up that particular verse in Bible Hub, there are a couple of um, references that I'll, I'll read one, for instance. Let me pull it up. The Weymouth New Testament, it says, um, we are not to resemble Cain, who was a child of the evil one and killed his own brother. And so both John and Yeshua are speaking about what happened in the garden that when Christ references and says, you are of your father, the devil, uh, I know you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me. All of that, that that's what they're talking about. And just to clarify that, that Christ is, you know, because again, you don't have to go outside of the words of Christ or the apostles to get clarity on this as teaching. But when the multitudes were sent away and the apostles came to him and asked him, asked him to explain to them the parable of the terrors of the field. First, he said, I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. And so he's specifying that this is a secret, which, you know, from the foundation of the world. The, the foundation of the world was... <clears throat> pretty much tied to when Adam and Eve were cast out of paradise, that that was the beginning of their reality in this particular dimensional plane. And what was the first thing that happened? Cain was born because it was when she touched the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in paradise that she was transformed into flesh and Satan was able to beguile her and impregnated her with Cain. And so when they were cast out, that's why God said, the Lord God said in Genesis chapter 3, he said, because you ate of that fruit, you're going to bring forth children in sorrow uh, and suffering. And why her punishment would be childbirth. And so when she was exiled here, to the earth with Adam, that was one of the first things that happened to her. You know, the, of course, it took a little while, but <clears throat> that is what happened. And you can read the first book of Adam and Eve, specifically the Latin version called the Vitae et Atta de Ua. Uh, in that version, it speaks about how... Um, because she had failed again, her and Adam made a pact that they were going to go into. She was going to go into the Tigris River, and he was going to go into the Euphrates River, and they were going to have penance for 40 days. They were going to fast and, and stand in the river and have penance for that amount of time. But she was deceived again by Satan and led to come out and to break her penance, and then she declared that she was just going to wander towards the West until she succumbed to death. But in wandering away and walking away and and trying to just leave Adam because uh, she felt sorry that she had caused his downfall, then she felt the pain of childbirth coming upon her, and she didn't know what was happening. And so she cried out to the luminaries to tell Adam when they went back towards the east to let Adam know. And that's when he prayed for her. And then the angel, the, uh, the angel Michael came to her and prepared her for childbirth and also brought Adam to her. Um, and after, you know, she conceived Cain, who interestingly enough, uh, when he was conceived, 
he immediately had the ability to walk. And so he was not like a normal child. And so anyways, Christ said, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, which that again is referencing the parable of the kingdom uh, in verse 24, just a few, you know, 10 passages or 10 or so passages prior. But the tares are the children of the wicked one, which this is a reference to that particular verse in 1 John chapter 3, verse 12. Because most of the translations are, whereas it says here in the Weymouth New Testament, we are not to resemble Cain who was a child of the evil one. Most of those translations are, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one. And so Christ is alluding to this particular verse, and he's referencing that Cain was indeed of that wicked one, and he's citing specifically in this passage, um, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. And then to clarify, in the next passage, in the next verse, verse 39, he says, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. Who is that enemy? That enemy is he that snuck into the garden and sowed the tares while men were sleeping, while Adam was asleep or not paying attention to his wife. Which is, again, in the parable of the kingdom, just a few passages previous. And then he goes on to say that the harvest is at the end of the world. And so he's tying together that the harvest of the wheat and the tares is at the end of the world with his second coming. And that the reapers are the angels, as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. Um, and then he says that the then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Because again, most people don't understand, don't get this, which is why. In verse 10, it says, And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not giving. Not given. And then uh, I'll skip just a little couple more verses. And then he says, Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. I'm going to skip one more. And then, um, well, I'll just read this. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Esaias, which saith, By hearing you shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing you shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. And their eyes they have closed lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them and to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. So, you know, that's when he goes into the parable of the sower and the parable of the kingdom. I mean, how much clearer do you want it? And it's not difficult to make these associations. I mean, the garden, there's only one parable of the garden, and it has everything to do with the fall of Adam and Eve at the very beginning of the entirety of, of the biblical narrative. And so how can you not make that connection? 
how can you say that what Christ is talking about here in Matthew 13 has nothing to do with Genesis chapter 3? It has everything to do with Genesis chapter 3. You can't understand what he's talking about without making such connection. Which again, how in any manner, in any way, does it make any kind of sense that all of these things, the curses, the, you know, Eve giving birth to Cain, uh, her desiring the angel, uh, Adam then uh, eating also of the fruit and bearing Abel, you know, giving, impregnating her with Abel. How does that tie into an apple? How in any way can it make sense if it's a literal fruit from a tree? I mean, even the fact that I'm going to put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, how in any way does an apple tree have enmity or it can bear enmity? It can't. And yet, people think I'm crazy for believing this? I think you're crazy for not. I mean, really, because you would really have to be more insane to believe that the fruit is an apple than to believe that it has some kind of sexual connotation associated to it which it's only by deciphering the fruit and her eating of it as being connected to a sexual a carnal act that the curses can then be made sense of and again when you look at the hebrew the terms for fruit um you know, and for seed, perie, perite, and zera in the Hebrew, th when you look up those terms, they have everything to do with children, ancestors, offspring, seed, and to the sexual act. And so you're going to tell me that I'm reading into the story? Yeah, I'm reading into it. I'm reading the Strong's Concordance, the Hebrew definitions and translations of those English words. What are you reading? Because when I read the Strong's Concordance, the translations of those words, it's obvious, it's absolutely clear that Eve eating fruit from the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil and her being beguiled by the serpent, that all of those actions, all of those behaviors, all of those definitions are connected to a sexual act which took place, which led her to be pregnant, which is why it says in verse 16, unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Okay, so, all right. Eve ate an apple, but yet it's going to lead to her having uh, greatly multiplied her sorrow and her conception and that she's going to, in sorrow, bring forth children? Come on, really? And when you ask everybody, because most people are completely adverse and opposed to this as teaching, when you ask them uh, to explain why it is that they're against this information, they can't provide you an answer. Not anything that is rational makes any kind of sense, which would explain all of these parables and all of these teachings in the manner that I am sharing them with you. 
and yet I'm the crazy one. Oh, besides those of you that also, you know, think this way, you're the crazy ones too. We're all the crazy ones. All right, um, and so I guess we can go ahead into this other, this last, last portion because it is in this um, crushing the head of the serpent, which again, the connections to the Genesis 3.15, the fulfillment of that prophecy has everything to do with the early insistence of the, uh, the Adamic patriarchs to never mix or intermarry in with the children of Cain. And you can find that also in the first book of Adam and Eve in book two, where it talks about the 10 lineages of Cain and Adam in the, you know, the early world and how Adam and Seth and, um, and Enos and all of the patriarchs, Yared, Noah, um, Enoch, they all warned their children to not mix or in, intermarry with the children of Cain. And that when you understand this, it is only by understanding this difference between the seed lines that it then makes sense why it was that all of the patriarchs and the apostles kept great detailed Genealogy, genealogical lists and who begot whom and who was born of whom. You know, all that stuff that we skip over and find just completely boring and that most people just, you know, skip to the next part. And yet all of that is very relevant and very important when you understand that there are two seed lines here upon the earth suddenly all of that information becomes very critical. All right, so I'm going to just read from, this is uh, chapter 15 of my new book. It's called Crushing the Head of the Serpent. This will give you an idea of what I've been writing about too. All right. I'll start from this particular passage here. It says this. All of these sources verify the contention of these two bloodlines and show why it is that the early patriarchs throughout the history of most of the books of the Holy Scriptures are so very careful to cite lineages on who begot whom and who sired who. Biblical scholars that do not understand that there is a real serpent seed here dwelling among the sons of Adam find it difficult to comprehend why the early prophets spent so much time and what seems to them wasted effort to write down all these extensive genealogies. Why else would the Lord God and his prophets find it necessary to repeat over and over the details of such accounting if it were not critical for some reason that has become lost to modern perspective. It's my opinion that such repetition was and is vastly important because of the efforts by the seed of Cain and the powers that be to hide their existence. They have been since the early generations convoluting information which identifies them as Satan's own. They have also been hiding the prophetic details of Yeshua's coming as the Savior Messiah to be born of the pure lineage of Adam. His incarnation in the flesh as the seed of the woman is first prophesied in the second part of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 15, which says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This prophecy was fulfilled the day that Yahushua was crucified on Golgotha, also known as Calvary, 
the hill of the skull, which is an escarpment located north of Jerusalem's old city walls. It is said to be referred to as the place of the skull due to its resemblance to a human head with sunken eyes, nose, and mouth. It's mentioned three times in scripture. Matthew chapter 27, verse 33. And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull. Now, this is important, a place of a skull. And I'll explain why here in just a second. In Mark chapter 15, verse 22, And they bring him unto the place Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of a skull. Okay. John chapter 19, verse 17. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. Now notice, in all three of these verses, Golgotha is known or referenced as the place of a skull. Now, the question is, whose skull? And that question can be answered by looking deeply into the word Golgotha, which means Goliath of Gath, when you look into it and you understand it. And so, reading forward. It's my belief, however, that the real reason this area is known as the hill or place of the skull is because David had brought Goliath's head as trophy into Jerusalem and buried it there at Golgotha outside of the city walls. And that this was done during that time to prove to all of Israel that he had in fact slain the giant Philistine champion which had daily insulted and ridiculed his people. Golgotha, which means Goliath of Gath, is called the hill of the skull, in my opinion, because it is the location where the Most High had instructed David to bury the head of Goliath. It would lay there for millennia until Yahushua crucified there would fulfill the Genesis 3.15 prophecy. Because when Christ was crucified on the cross at Golgotha, he, as the seed of the woman... Uh, all right, we'll be right back. I apologize. Uh, for whatever reason, it didn't let me unmute there for a second. But um, what I was saying was that I wanted to share really quick something that I had read into the chat room. And I said this, I'm proud and honored to fellowship among all of you insane ones. It's a blessing to call you my friends and to be crazy amongst you. I'd rather be crazy and found than lost and walking around, or in my case, wheeling around. And Simply Tribal put in the chat room, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely. For so persecuted the prophets which were before you. And yes, I absolutely agree. And I, um, you know, we're in good company. They thought the prophets, the apostles, Christ crazy. Uh, most people still do consider him uh, crazy and insane. And um, and so, yes, we're in good company. All right. And so I wanted to reiterate really quick that I am reading from the second book of the Great Contest. It's the one that I'm working on now. This is chapter 15, Crushing the Head of the Serpent. And as I was elaborating upon before we went to break there, I'll go back just a little bit. Um, 
that it was when Christ was crucified, it said, all right, I'll, I'll just go back one sentence. I'll read it. Golgotha, which means Goliath of Gath, is called the Hill of the Skull, in my opinion, because it is the location where the Most High had instructed David to bury the head of Goliath. And the reason he had instructed him to bury it there is because it would be there that Goliath's head would lay for millennia until Yahushua crucified in that exact spot would, in this act, fulfill the Genesis 3.15 prophecy of... Um, of him crushing the head of the serpent and the serpent nipping at his heel. And how was that fulfilled? All right, I'll explain. When Christ was crucified on the cross at Golgotha, he, as the seed of the woman, as the prophecy states, was in fact crushing the head or the skull of Goliath who as the seed of the serpent was at the same time uh, nipping at his heel. All right. And so that was the fulfillment. The circumstances of his death and resurrection miraculously fulfilled the condition of what was then a 4,000-year-old revelation and so how amazing is that you can find a, a, a little bit more detail of this in first samuel chapter 17 verses 51 through 54 where it says he david ran and stood over the philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath and slew him and cut off his head. And the Philistines, seeing that their champion was dead, fled away. And the children of Israel, returning after they had pursued the Philistines, fell upon their camp. And David, taking the head of the Philistine, brought it to Jerusalem, but his armor he put in his tent. And so... There you go. It tells you in 1 Samuel that David used Goliath's own sword after he had used a sling stone and stunned him. Remember, he picked up five stones. And the reason I believe he picked up five stones is because Goliath had four brothers which if you read further in First Chronicles and um, in, in the book of Kings, uh, First and Second Kings, somewhere around there, it mentions in story about how David and his servants and some of his brethren, how they had killed Saph was one of the giants, Ishben Bob, um, I forget the the names of the others. I've got them all written down in one of my books, but anyways, all they had went to war against Goliath and his brothers for a very long time. And so in my opinion, he picked up the five stones because he had one for each of these the you know, these Philistine giant champions. And he used the one and stunned Goliath and then ran up to him, grabbed his sword and cut his head off. And then in order to show and to verify, because you have to remember, remember the story of David and Goliath that before Saul was out there with Israel and every day Goliath came out and ridiculed them and asked them to send over one person to fight him. And he said that, if I, you know, there's no need for everybody to die. Let one person come and fight me. And if I slew him, 
you become our servants, and if we slew your champion, then you will become ours. Uh, or if he, if you know, your champion kills me, we will become your servants. And and so this is the challenge. And so he was boasting and ridiculing and making fun of the Israelites and their God every day. And it was only because David was visiting. He was um he wasn't a soldier, but he was a shepherd boy and he was delivering as the youngest son of Jesse, he was delivering food and rations to the soldiers that were encamped there on that battlefield or near that battlefield. And daily they had to endure his ridicule. And so when David heard it, you know, he was incensed. And then he decided, well, I'm going to go out and I'm going to fight him and I'm going to slew him. And God is with me. And that's exactly what happened. And so after he killed Goliath, he took his head as a trophy back to Jerusalem to show the Israel the Israelites, the people of Israel that were living in Jerusalem. Because, you know, what better way to verify that you had in fact performed this deed than to bring the head of the giant that you had killed. And so I'm sure there was a grand ceremony and great relief and much celebration amongst the people of Israel when David brought forth and showed to them, yeah, uh, I, I killed the giant. I killed the, the person that had been for however long ridiculing Israel, making fun of us and degrading our God. And... You know, it couldn't be a, a prouder moment for David. And I'm sure that this is one of the one of the events, one of the most pinnacle moments of his life that led him to becoming king and to the most high God standing him up so that he would in fact um you know, be included because God knew even before, you know, before, even before the fall of Adam and Eve, he knew the end for the beginning. He knew that David would be, it would be of his line that his only son, Yeshua, as the only begotten, would incarnate into and be born of. And just as it says um, in Ephesians about how he knew us before even the foundations of this world, God knew us and understood our stories, even though we did not. And he, and it's not that we are all, even though we are predestinated in some manner, we still have free will to choose within moment as to what we want to do and what we want to accomplish. It's just that God can see ahead and he understands and knows what we are going to do with every moment. And he knows that with every person, every nation, every people, uh, all the tribes, all the tongues, all the everyone here, what everybody is going to do. And that's why he was able to prophesy and give us the gospel to show that everything was understood and known by him before it ever had happened or had come to pass. Just like with Daniel being given and shown the, the prophecy of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the statue of the four kingdoms. You know, the Babylon, Media, Persia, the Greeks and the Romans how that vision and that dream and the prophetic fulfillment of it span 
thousands of years and is still being fulfilled even in this day and age. They shall mingle themselves among the seed of men. That's still going on. It's still being fulfilled. And so how incredible. All of that, to me, verifies, affirms without a doubt that the gospel is the word of God, is the prophetic, divinely inspired word of the Most High God, the creator that fashioned our enclosed world system and that created us in his image. And why you wouldn't want to study the word of the creator is just absolutely beyond me. Because these are just a few of the many hundreds of thousands of secrets that are encoded into his texts and his books and his word and his scriptures as passed down, as given to us through the many prophets which were inspired, as it says, Second Peter, that the prophets were inspired to bring it to us in the manner that they did, which that is the basis for the work of Ivan Panin. I apologize that um, earlier I had it on mute. I, and thanks. Um, thank you, Kathy, for always keeping me in check. I appreciate you, sister. Um, and so, yes, all of these things absolutely verify, absolutely affirm that the scriptures are prophetic. And because they are prophetic and because they are the word of God, they will be fulfilled in 100% exact detail as he laid them out. And so why would you not want to study and read them to understand what's coming, if only to, to be able to warn your loved ones, your family, your children, to prepare yourself and your spouses and your children and your parents, uh, whoever is amongst you that is alive and that is important to you. Why would you not want to be able to understand what is coming and i mean the whole thing of salvation and our eternal inheritance and being through christ that eternity is secured in him that is such a deeply profound and overwhelmingly awesome thought to ponder, to wonder about, to hold for even moment that we can have an eternal inheritance through him. Why would you want not want to know about our Savior Messiah, our, the Christ? Why would you not want to study everything you could about him, about who he was, about what he did, what he accomplished, and being the word, the memra, the only begotten of the Father, and coming into the flesh, living a sinless life, in prophetically fulfilling the th many, many prophecies which were associated to him. 314 plus just in the Old Testament scriptures. And that's not including, I mean, there's so many more found in the extra biblical text, which at, at some point I hope to be able to put together a book for you of all the different passages which I have separated as teaching, uh, which allude to and which verify that the ancient prophets prior to even the flood of Noah's day that all of them knew about. 
even Adam being cast out of paradise, he would given a prophecy of the coming of Christ. Even then, that's how far back it goes. And so I can only wish, I can only wish this truth to be poured out on all of you and that each of you could understand the profundity of that thought that Jesus Christ, Yeshua, is the way and the truth and the life. And how real that is. I could only, uh, I can only wish and I pray that the Most High God lead all of you in discernment so that you can understand it in the way that I do and that you can embrace it in the way that I do and that we could encourage our loved ones and those that we care about to similar discernment that we could all come to know our real reasons for being here and what all of this is about, what we are here to do, that we are the final generation, and that we're at the end game. We're at the closing scene, that this is the moment when the the hero comes to gather his bride, uh, the, the fulfillment of the Cinderella story where um, the, the king comes to seek out his bride or, or the, the prince comes to kiss and to awaken his sleeping beauty. This is it. This is the culmination. We are the fig tree generation. It's a ride off into the sunset. That's what we're preparing for, to ride off into the sunset with our king and lord to wave goodbye to those that are left behind to those that for whatever reason did not prepare for the coming of the bridegroom you know i, I just give thanks to god that we at least know about all these things that we are awakened to them and that we can use this critical knowledge, this critical discernment and this understanding of these teachings to make a difference for ourselves and for as many others as we possibly can in the time that we are allowed reprieve, but that the long suffering is coming to, the, uh, to an end. The time of the reign of the fallen angels is coming to an end. The duplicity, the duality, the pain and the suffering of this world is coming to an end. For unless the days were shortened, there should be no flesh left. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. God bless all. Good night. Where do we come from? Are you curious about the origins of the human race? Join me, Gavin McCall, and a variety of guests on Ancient Humans, where we decipher world events, explore scientific theories, 
personal